Hello, my name is Peter Harry from Emory University, uh, Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences. And today for this Rankin Ray Touchstone Lecture, I'll be talking about multiparametric prostate MRI for prostate cancer and how to use the PIRADS version 2 reporting system with that MRI. To start, I just want to say that I have nothing to disclose. At the end of this presentation, you should be able to understand the basic principles of prostate cancer and the imaging findings that define the malignancy, be able to use standardized reporting when reporting using PIRADS version 2, and identify the imaging findings of the PIRADS version 2 lesions every type in the peripheral zone and the transitional zones. We're going to start with prostate anatomy. The prostate is divided into four sections. The first section is the transitional zone. The transitional zone is the area of the prostate that wraps around the urethra. This area is small in younger men, but increases in size as men age. This is the area that develops benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. And this is what causes the obstructive uropathy symptoms seen in men. As the BPH develops, glandular tissue forms in the transitional zone. And because there's now glandular tissue in the transitional zone, cancers can develop here. 20 to 25 percent of cancers develop in the transitional zone. The second section is the central zone. The central zone is still part of the central gland made up of the central zone and transitional zone, but is posterior to the transitional zone, and it wraps around the ejaculatory ducts, which are made up of the seminal vesicle ducts and the vas deferens. This area starts wider posteriorly and narrows anteriorly. It sometimes can be mistaken for cancer due to its imaging characteristics. However, only less than 1% of cancers actually develop in the central zone. Because it's rare to have cancer develop here, cancer found in the central zone is usually secondary to invasion from the transitional zone or peripheral zone. But a cancer that does develop here naturally tends to be aggressive. The third section is the peripheral zone. The peripheral zone wraps around the central gland, again made up of the transitional zone and the central zone. This is the area that the physician feels for nodules when a digital rectal exam is performed. The peripheral zone is quite glandular and because of that 75 to 80 percent of cancers are developed in the peripheral zone. The fourth section is the anterior fibromuscular stroma, right here. This is an anterior area of fibromuscular tissue that has no glandular tissue. It does not develop cancer, and it does decrease in size over time, and sometimes is hard to find in older men. It is only mentioned because sometimes it can mimic the look of a prostate cancer on T2-weighted imaging. These are four high-resolution T2-weighted images of the prostate gland to show the anatomy on MRI. Here on this axial image, you can see the T2 hyperintense peripheral zone and the transitional zone with well circumscribed heterogeneous appearing BPH nodules. The urethra here is mildly collapsed due to the BPH. On this coronal image, you can see the urethra in its entirety with the transitional zone around the urethra and the, again, T2 hyperintense peripheral zone here. On the sagittal image, you can see a black line between the transitional zone and the peripheral zone. That's called the surgical capsule. It is not a real capsule. Instead, it's made up of compressed prostate tissue. However, it is often seen an easy way to identify the difference between the transitional zone and the peripheral zone. The prostatic capsule, which is an actual fibromuscular capsule around the prostate, wraps around the majority of the peripheral zone. And this is the border that's used to define extracapsular extension, which we'll talk about later. The anterior fibromuscular stroma is a small black area right here. Again, it shrinks over time. And the central zone is this heterogeneous, mildly T2 hypointense area in the posterior portion of the prostate, posterior to the transitional zone. And you can see here the ejaculatory cucks coming in. Additionally, for reporting purposes, the prostate is arbitrarily divided into three sections. The cranial most section is called the base, the mid section is called the mid gland, and the caudal most section is called the apex. 
the base of the prostate gland touches the base of the urinary bladder. In pyrads, these areas can be further subdivided for further subclassification of the exact location of the cancer. However, for the purposes of this talk, we will not go into the subdivisions, but it's important to know the peripheral zone, the central zone, the transitional zone, and the anterior fibromuscular stroma. And as you can see, as you go down towards the apex, the central gland and the anterior fibromuscular stroma is smaller compared to the peripheral zone. Okay, so what is multiparametric MRI? Multiparametric MRI is an MRI that has multiple parameters to help define prostate cancer. It has five uses to locate lesions in patients that have not been diagnosed with prostate cancer but have a rising PSA, for full staging of a person diagnosed with prostate cancer to determine treatment strategy, for, treat, for biopsy planning, whether it's MRI-guided biopsy or MRI ultrasound fusion biopsy, following patients on active surveillance, or evaluated a previously treated patient who now has rising PSA. So the first parameter that all multiparametric MRI have to have is T2 weighted images. And these should be in three planes, axial, coronal, and sagittal, as you see. And they should be high resolution T2 weighted images. This will be important for the transitional zone, as we will describe soon. The second parameter is diffusion weighted imaging. This is the primary sequence for the peripheral zone. For prostate cancer, the gradient must be a high gradient with at least a B gradient of over 1400 suggested. At my institution, we use a B2000 gradient. And the last is a dynamic contrast enhanced image, which is multiple imaging through the prostate as the contrast passes through the system. And we'll discuss its use in just a second. Other sequences that are not required but are, can be obtained are T1 weighted pre-contrast axial images with or without fat saturation. These can be used without, without fat saturation to look for the neurovascular bundles or with fat saturation to look for blood secondary to prior biopsy which can be a mimic for cancer on the diffusion weighted images. The post-contrast images can be used to look for lymphadenopathy and enhancing osseous lesions for complete staging. So PIRADS version 2 has five assessment categories, one through five, with one meaning very low suspicion of cancer, two being low, three intermediate, four high, and five being very high suspicion of cancer. Unlike BIRADS in breast imaging, there is no definite percentage chance of cancer associated with each one of these. And in some cases, especially at our institution, PIRADS-1 is used for normal. PIRADS-2 is used for a benign lesion that has a known entity but not likely cancer. And 3, 4, and 5 used for lesions that should be biopsied. We are now going to go through the peripheral zone and then the transitional zone to describe each of these categories so you can determine what the imaging characteristics to help you define prostate lesions. And we're going to start with the peripheral zone. So in the peripheral zone, PIRADS category 1, the DWI is described as absolutely no abnormality. Here you can see the B2000 image and the ADC map. You can see that there's no increased intensity on the DWI and no hypointensity on the ADC map. Also on the T2 you have uniform hyperintense signal throughout and again this is considered normal and is not reported on in most cases. In the peripheral zone, PIRADS number two is an indistinct hypointense area on the ADC map. Here you can see on our ADC map this wedge shapes and linear, barely hypointense areas throughout the peripheral zone. It can correspond to small areas of minimal hyperintensity on the DWI. And on the T2, you'll see linear or wedge shaped hypointensities or diffuse mild hypointensity that's with indistinct margins. So as you can see, these correspond to these linear and wedge-shaped areas on the axial T2 weighted images. These are very low risk of cancer and the most of the time this is secondary to prior biopsy or prostatitis and these are often not reported on in our reports. PIRADS 3 in the peripheral zone is defined as a focal mildly or moderately hypo-intense area on the ADC map or an iso-intensity or mild hyper-intensity on the high D 
DWI B value. So as you can see, you have multiple focal areas of mild hyperintensity on the DWI map, but these are in the central gland, but the ones here in the peripheral zone correspond to these small areas of hypointensity on the ADC map. These are not quite that hyperintense on the DWI and not quite that hypointense on the ADC map. The T2 characteristics are a heterogeneous signal that's non-circumscribed or non-rounded. It's moderately hypointense and does not fall into categories 2, 4, or 5. So in many cases, PIRATS3 is an area to place a lesion that quite doesn't fit 2, 4, or 5. And as you can see, there's this mild hypointensity here in the right peripheral zone from about 7 to 9 o'clock that corresponds to this mild hypointensity on the ADC and this mild hyperintensity on the DWI. PIRADS4 is a focal markedly hypointensity on the ADC with a marked hyperintensity on the DWI. It must measure less than 1.5 centimeters in greatest dimension. And as you can see on the ADC map, you have this focal area that's much more hyperintense compared to other areas around the prostate gland. And it corresponds to this much more focal hyperintensity here. On the T2, you'll find a circumscribed homogeneous moderate hyperintense mass that's less than 1.5 centimeters. It's important to note that in the peripheral zone, the lesions tend to be more focal and circumscribed when they're cancer. This is different from the transitional zone, as we'll describe. PIRADS5 is like PIRADS4 insofar as that it has to have a marked hypointensity on the ADC corresponding to a marked hyperintensity on the DWI maps. However, it can be invasive or greater than 1.5 centimeters. So as you can see on this example, the entire left peripheral zone is markedly hyperintense with a marked hypointensity on the ADC map. This is infiltrative cancer throughout the left peripheral zone of this prostate and it clearly measures greater than 1.5 centimeters despite the lack of a marker here. The T2 weighted image also demonstrates a focal hypo intensity that is greater than 1.5 centimeters or is invasive like PIRADS4. See here. But again it's bigger or can be invasive meaning going through the surgical capsule into the central gland or through the prostatic capsule into the extracapsular space. So now that we've defined what the lesions are for pyrides 1 through 5 in the peripheral zone, we're going to talk about how you finally score these lesions. In the peripheral zone, the DWI score is the most important score. And the reason for this is that the T2 weighted images are nonspecific in the peripheral zone. And this is because the peripheral zone is so T2 hyperintense, most pathologic entities cause T2 hypointensity. So while it would be very sensitive, it's extremely nonspecific. However, in the peripheral zone, one of the only real things that causes restricted diffusion that also causes T2 hypointensity is cancer. So the DWI score is the more important and the more specific score. So if you have scored the prostate as a 1, then the final PIRADS category is also a 1. If you've scored areas that are 2, the final PIRADS category is a 2. If you've scored areas that are 4, these focal hypointense ADC areas with hyperintensity on the DWI, less than 1.5 centimeters, then your final score for that lesion is a 4, telling the doctor a high chance of uh, probability of cancer. If you scored it a 5, then you've given a final PIRADS category of 5. The only one that has an extra step is PIRADS 3. If you've given a lesion of PIRADS3, you must then find the lesion on the corresponding dynamic contrast enhancement images. And what you're looking for is focal or early enhancement. If that lesion has focal and early enhancement compared to the rest of the prostate gland, then it's considered positive and it gets upgraded from a PIRADS3 to a PIRADS4. If this lesion does not have that early and focal enhancement, then the lesion stays a PIRADS3. And that's how you score the peripheral zone. And you can do this for multiple lesions as you see them. We're now going to switch to the transitional zone. <clears throat> the transitional zone PIRADS1 score is a homogeneous intermediate signal intensity. This is normally seen in a normal prostate. Because most multiparametric MRI for the prostate is done for a patient that tends to be older and looking for prostate cancer, it's very rare to find a normal transitional zone without BPH. So finding a PIRADS1 is rare. 
the DWI is normal. There's no abnormality on the ADC or DWI. Pyrats 2 in the transitional zone are circumscribed, hypointense, or heterogeneous in caps nodules, or BPH nodules. They have indistinct hypointensity on the ADC. So as you can see here in this prostate gland, is very enlarged. The transitional zone has caused atrophy of the peripheral zone, and you have multiple well-circumscribed, heterogeneously T2 hypo and hyperintense nodules throughout the transitional zone. The name for this is also known as organized chaos. The T2 dark areas are the stroma, and the T2 bright areas are the glandular tissue of the BPH. This here is a Foley catheter within the urethra because the patient was having severe obstructive symptoms. These areas, again, can be, are well encapsulated, and you can clearly see the border. It's important to note, however, that some BPH nodules can cause significant restricted diffusion. However, that does not increase the likelihood of cancer. Transitional zone pyrans 3 is a heterogeneous T2 intensity with obscured margins. And this includes any lesion that doesn't fall into pyrans 2, 4, or 5. So as you can see here in the left transitional zone, you can see this partially circumscribed nodule, but on the left portion, you can see the margin because obscured. And you can also see that it's becoming more hypointense and less heterogeneous. On the DWI, this corresponds to a focal mildly or moderately hypointense area on the ADC with a mildly hyperintensity on the DWI. And as you can see, this area here and here. As you can see that this area on the, on the DWI and ADC map doesn't look significantly different in other areas of the transitional zone. PIRADS 4 in the transitional zone corresponds to a lenticular or non-circumscribed homogeneous mildly hypointense lesion less than 1.5 centimeters, as you can see here. Now note that this is different from the peripheral zone where cancerous lesions tend to be more focal and more circumscribed. So this is a big difference. Here you can see that this lesion is more lenticular and the margins are much more obscured with the surrounding BPH nodules. It's also much more hypointense. Sometimes this is called the smudge charcoal sign. On the DWI and ADC, this corresponds to a focal area of hyperintensity on the DWI and a focal hypointensity on the ADC map. Transitional zone PIRADS5 is same as 4. You have this lenticular, irregular, non-circumscribed, obscured margin lesion that's greater than 1.5 centimeters or has invasive behavior. So as you can see here in the left transitional zone, you have this greater than 1.5 centimeter lesion with obscured and irregular margins that's markedly hypointense. Again, can sometimes be called a smudge charcoal sign, and as you can see, it doesn't have any of that T2 hyperintensity the BPH nodules have. And again, this corresponds to a focal hyperintensity on the DWI and a focal hypointensity on the ADC map, as you can see here. So now that you know the five different ways to score lesions for the transitional zone, how do you get the final PIRAD score? For the transitional zone, the final PIRAD score is based off the T2 score. And this is because, as I said earlier, BPH nodules can restrict diffusion, making restricted diffusion in nonspecific for this in the setting of the transitional zone. So while the DWI score was very specific in the peripheral zone, it's nonspecific in the transitional zone. So the T2 parameters are much more important. If you see a normal T2 weighted transitional zone, give it a one, then the final PIRADS is a one. If you see multiple BPH nodules, they're scored a two, the final PIRADS category is a two. Now, in our institution, not all BPH nodules are called, just the ones that may appear to the physicians as abnormal compared to the surrounding BPH nodules. Those are the ones that are usually reported. A T2 score of 4 becomes a final PIRAD score of 4, and a 5 becomes a 5. But what if you give something a 3, that heterogeneous signal that, not, that with some skewered margins that's not quite a 2, 4, or 5? You then look at the DWI score, which is why we talked about them. If you think the DWI score is a 5, meaning it's markedly hypointense on the ADC and markedly hyperintense on the DWI and is greater than 1.5 centimeters, then you upgrade that 3 to a 4. If it's anything less than a 5, that 3 stays a 3. Okay. We're now going to take a quick break from the imaging findings to talk about prostate cancer staging. 
This is important because MRI is helpful for staging. However, it cannot help the physicians determine if the lesion is a T1 or T2 lesion. And that's because by definition, a T1 lesion cannot be felt by the physician or seen on transrectal ultrasound. Again, something MRI can't determine. A T1A is found accidentally on a transurethral section of the prostate in less than 5% of the tissue. T1B is the same thing except greater than 5% of the tissue. And a T1C is found on a needle biopsy purposely done for a rising PSA. A T2 lesion can be felt by the physician on physical exam or seen on transrectal ultrasound, but is confined to the prostate. MRI can help define the lesion, but since you can't tell if it's seen on an ultrasound or digital rectal exam, it doesn't define the T2 lesion. A T2A lesion is seen on less than half of only one side of the prostate. A T2B lesion is on greater than one half of only one side of the prostate and a T2C lesion is seen on both sides of the prostate gland. Now, a T3 and above lesions, this is where prostate MRI is helpful because this is looking for cancer beyond the prostate. So a T3 extends beyond the prostate, a T3A extends into the periprostatic fat or neurovascular bundles, but not the seminal vesicle, a T3B extends into the seminal vesicles, and a T4 grows into the neighboring organs except the seminal vesicles or the pelvic wall, and this is what you are looking for on your MRI. For lymph nodes, an N0 means there's no lymph nodes that are involved. N1 is cancer is spread to the local lymph nodes, and we're going to define those in just a little bit. An M0 is spread beyond the local lymph nodes. So an M1A is cancer spread to distant lymph nodes. Again, we're going to define this shortly. An M1B is cancer to the bones. And an M1C is cancer spread to other distant organs with or without osseous metastases. So let's talk about extracapsular spread of disease. It can extend with or without neurovascular bundle involvement into the seminal vesicles or into adjacent organs. So here we have an axial 2 2 weighted image with a lesion in the peripheral zone here, this marked focal, well-circumscribed hypointensity. But as you can see, the prostate capsule is here, and suddenly it's lost. And you can see this cancer spreading and involving the neurovascular bundles. So this is what you're looking for. Now, this lesion does extend into the pelvic wall and would be upgraded to a T4. However, for this example, we're just pointing out the neurovascular bundle invasion. And the neurovascular bundle are these small dots right here. The other side, they're right here. As you can see, there's fat around them and they're normal, but on this, the cancer has spread into them. So the signs you're looking for is a bulging prostate capsule, the capsular breach with direct extension, asymmetry of the neurovascular bundles, or obviously tumor encasing in this case, here. Seminal vesicle involvement upgrades the tumor to a T3B. And what you're looking for is loss of the normal architecture of the seminal vesicles, direct tumor extension from the base into the seminal vesicles, and T2 hypointense signal with restricted diffusion. So as you can see here on this coronal T2 weighted image, here's the apex of the prostate in the base. You can see this T2 hypointense focal mass growing from the prostate gland into the right and left seminal vesicles. You can see the same thing on the axial images with this mass that does restrict diffusion growing into the central seminal vesicles here. And again, this is T3B. T4 is involvement of the adjacent organs. Again, the bladder, the rectum, the pelvic wall. And this is an example, as you can see, on this coronal weighted image of a central gland or transitional zone tumor here, this obscured margined, irregular, hypointense lesion growing cranially into the bladder. And as you can see, that the, the black detrusor muscle is invaded here. This is the axial image showing the invasion of the detrusor muscle here. And as you can see, again, because this is cancer, it does have focal diffusion restriction here. So again, you're looking for direct extension, hypointense T2 signal, enhancement and restricted diffusion. We're going to talk about the lymph nodes. Here you have to look at the size, the shape, and the internal architecture. But unlike most lymph nodes in the body, where we use a 10 millimeter short axis cutoff, a 6 millimeter short axis cutoff has resulted in a sensitivity and specificity of 78% and 98%, excuse me, 97% respectively. Now we're going to talk about lymph node metastases. You have to look at the size, the shape, and the internal architecture, whether they've lost their reniform shape, their fatty hilum, and again, the short axis. 
However, unlike most lymph nodes in the body, instead of using 10 millimeters, we use a six millimeter cutoff because that resulted in a sensitivity and specificity of 78 and 97% respectively. And it's also important to know what a regional versus a non-regional lymph node is because this determines N1 disease versus M1A disease. So let's talk about the regional lymph nodes. Regional lymph nodes are defined as external and internal iliac lymph nodes. This upgrades to N1. As you can see, we have a rounded lymph node with abnormal architecture that's greater than 6 millimeters along the external iliac vessels. Another example here in a different patient shows a similar type of lymph node that's enlarged along the internal iliac vessels on the left. Non-regional lymph nodes are considered inguinal lymph nodes and common iliac lymph nodes. So while these still are in the pelvis, technically they are considered distant metastases because they are not normal or they're not the first drainage areas for prostate cancer. Now there are no abnormal lymph nodes on this example, but again I'm just showing the area of the inguinal lymph nodes and the common iliac lymph nodes here. And again, this is M1A disease, not N1 disease. Finally, we're going to talk about osseous metastases. This upgrades the cancer to an M1B. And what you're looking for are enhancing lesions on the post-contrast T1-weighted images. Here you can see we have multiple enhancing lesions in the iliac bone on the right. Now, all prostate MRI does not cover the entire skeleton, and sometimes a nuclear medicine study can be ordered if you're looking for diffuse osseous metastases. I appreciate you listening to this talk, and I hope that you are able to now use Pyrads V2 to describe lesions throughout the prostate gland and have a structured report.